Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the talks this morning. Um, I was asked to talk about droughts and uh, climate extremes and some of the lessons for the future. It's interesting, here's a uh, dust storm in, in western Oklahoma, so a very dramatic picture from just last year when some of the scenes of the Dust Bowl were recreated as a result of the drought that they're having in the, in the southern plains. So a very dramatic photo. Uh, this photo here, however, is from Nebraska during the drought in 2012. It's not as dramatic, but certainly the impacts from the drought in 2012 were very dramatic in Nebraska. So much so, in fact, that my colleague, Mark Sobota, captured this. This is a standard rain gauge. But in 2012, what they did is they exchanged the standard rain gauge with this rain gauge in, in Nebraska. So um, that was dramatic in, in Nebraska. The way I like to start, to put my talk into some context, which I think fits in perfectly with what Dr. Henry has already talked about this morning is put this concept of drought and food security uh, together. And the way I like to do it is by showing this slide, which is one of my favorites. It's also from FAO, and it shows the exporting and importing uh, regions of the world in terms of uh, grain trade, so on the, on the crop side. And the, the orange circles are the amount of exports going out, and the green circles are the amount of imports coming in. And so what you see is kind of this global market. And I think it illustrates that uh, what we used to think of droughts being localized, now droughts have global imp implications because of these international markets. And this was best illustrated by a drought that occurred in 2010 in, the, in Russia. Uh, that affected the winter wheat uh, conditions, and that drought in Russia rippled across the world and caused uh, food riots in places like Mozambique and other parts of, of the world. So it really illustrates how interconnected we all are by the global markets and the impact something like a drought might have. The slide also provides some context in terms of why do we need to prepare for natural disasters. This is data put together by Munich Re. Munich Re is a reinsurance company, so they insure insurance companies. And so natural disaster events are very critical for them. So what you see is a timeline from 1980 on the left up through 2012, and they divide the events into three categories. The reddish color are the geophysical events, uh, there's not much of a trend occurring with geophysical events with time. That doesn't mean they're not important. There's still a number of those events occurring. There are trends, however, occurring in their data for both the meteorological events and the hydrological events. And you can see those trends depicted on this graphic. That's very important for a company like Munich Re, and I think it does show trends for the future. One thing to note, droughts are probably not very well uh, included in, in data like this. It's just not a, a big factor for, uh, for a company like Munich Re. So given that, uh, the United Nations had a report that came out in, a, in 2013, and what they said is that the losses from natural disaster events worldwide since 2000 was in the range of about $2.5 trillion, so a big amount. And one of the quotes from that report was that losses from floods, earthquakes, and drought will continue to escalate, and then I added, unless actions are taken to reduce disaster risks. This is a question I get asked all the time. What can we do to reduce our risk to droughts? or you could put in floods, earthquakes, whatever you wanted into that sentence. And so I, I would argue there's a lot we can do. And one of the ways I like to illustrate that is with this next graphic, 
which is the cycle of disaster management. This graphic comes out of the emergency management literature, the natural hazards literature, and it divides this cycle into two parts. The lower part in red is crisis management. Those are the things you do after a hazard event occurs to kind of recover from that event. The problem is if we only focus on crisis management, we'll never take any actions that will reduce our risk to future hazard events. Those are the things that we have to do in the risk management portion of the cycle, that part that's in blue. This would include monitoring and early warning, planning, and mitigation. And so I would argue it's doing those three things that hopefully will reduce our risk to future hazard events as they occur around the world or across the United States. In this context, mitigation are actions or, or uh, projects that you would take that would reduce your risk to future uh, hazard events. So a little bit different than how mitigation is used in the climate change uh, community. So where are we in terms of drought risk management? This is a, a, a picture taken from 1976 of Shasta Reservoir in California. You could probably take a very similar picture today uh, of what's occurring, but in 1976, uh, California was experiencing a very severe drought, as was much of the West, and reports coming out after that drought really illustrated that the United States was not doing much in terms of drought risk management and preparing ourselves for future drought events. So taking those reports, Don Wilhite at the University of Nebraska uh, started working on drought, and he eventually put together the National Drought Mitigation Center. He founded it in 1995. And our mission is to lessen societal vulnerability to drought by promoting planning and the adoption of appropriate risk management techniques. That should now sound very familiar to you, because really what it is, it's, a, it's, uh, it's focusing on those activities within the circle up there in the risk management part of that cycle. This is the mission of the National Drought Mitigation Center. So for my talk, um, as we have been working at the National Drought Mitigation Center, some lessons have emerged over the years that really address the theme of uh, the, the morning session, changes, challenges, and opportunities. I think really follow well on Dr. Henry's presentation um, earlier. One of the first lessons, and it comes from Daniel Connell, who's at Australian National University. I really like this uh, quote. Is he said that societies will manage climate variability and potential changes in the same way that they will manage droughts, for better or worse. So think about that statement for a moment. It's talking about um, how, uh, well, it, it's talking about, I've lost my train of thought for a moment. Um, anyway, um, I really like that it, it gets you to think about how are we doing in managing droughts? Are we doing a good job or not doing a good job? And how do droughts relate to this issue of climate variability and potential change? And one way to do that is uh, this graphic here which illustrates the time scales of climate variability. So there are uh, climate variability events that occur on the short time scales, and there are climate event uh, variability events that happen on longer time scales, decades to centuries. And what's really interesting is that droughts occur on all those time scales. So droughts are a good institutional uh, capacity um, a way to look at how institutional capacity is uh, being used in, in dealing with uh, climate events. Why is this so important? Well, one reason I would argue is because droughts are a normal part of climate in the United States. This graphic here shows the percent of the United States in severe to extreme drought from 1895 there on the left hand side of the graphic up through uh, February of 2015 on the right, and you see droughts regularly occurring in the U.S. 
You can also see some of the major droughts stand out on this graphic. For example, 1934, when almost 70% of the U.S. was in severe to extreme drought during the Dust Bowl years. The 50s stand out. Um, you see the 60s drought were big drought years in the eastern United States and kind of the drought of record there. The 76 drought stands out. Um, late 88, um, the late 80s drought. And then about 2000, there were a series of drought. In 2012, we equaled or slightly surpassed the 1950s drought in terms of spatial extent. If you look at that, though, there's not really a trend that jumps out, of, out at you in terms of percent area in the U.S., but it does seem fairly active in those recent years since about 2000. Currently, though, this is very important because uh, this is the most recent U.S. drought monitor map which shows the current, the current drought conditions across the U.S., and we have two areas of, of uh, drought, persistent drought, long-term droughts occurring in the United States right now. The first one is in that southern plains area of western Oklahoma, uh, north, northern Texas, northwest Texas. That drought has been in existence since about October 2010, so it's definitely a multiple year drought occurring in that region. But you also see there's a major drought occurring in California. That drought began in the 2011-12 uh, snowpack uh, time frame, actually, and so that drought continues uh, in there, and, and it's actually a very interesting experiment in the institutional capacity that's taking place uh, related to that previous quote from Daniel Connell that I uh, showed a few slides ago. This graphic here is a time period of precipitation in uh, California from 1895 on the left up through 2014 on the right. And I also chose a two-year period like uh, Dr. Henry showed. So it's a running two-year average, annual average, uh, ending in December for each of those years from 1895. This most recent period is the driest 24-month period uh, in California there. But if you look at the other arrow, arrows in that diagram, the major drought periods in California, it's not so significantly different from some of these other droughts that have occurred. Uh, in around 1990, you see the 1976-77 drought is the third arrow over from, from the right there, and the 1930s drought, for example. But look at this next graphic. This graphic shows temperature for those same 24-month periods, two-year periods, uh, from 1895 on the left up through 2014 on the right. And what you see is that the temperature conditions, the setting for temperature in those exact same drought periods is completely different as you go through with time. So that the current drought that is being experienced in California is at a much higher temperature than what has occurred at those uh, past drought events. This has led to what John, Jonathan Overpeck at the University of Arizona has called hot droughts. And he makes the argument that we need to be expecting more of these hot droughts as we go forward in the future. And what does that mean in terms of our management strategies as we go forward? This is definitely a change that will influence society and animal agriculture. So some facts from California and from the West, the economic losses from these uh, droughts that we're seeing have been about $60 billion since 2011. The governor, uh, Brown, has announced a $1 billion plan just recently to address some of these uh, drought impacts. Views tree rings, one study has shown that this is the worst drought in about 1,200 years, according to these tree rings. And more interestingly, there's actually an uplift, a drought-induced uplift uh, in the California mountains of about 15 millimeters just as a result of this drought. Uh, very interesting. This graphic here uh, might be a little hard to see, but it's showing the impact of this drought on the snowpack in California. Uh, snow provides about 70 to 80% of the water supply in the western United States, so it's a huge 
uh, of huge importance and huge significance. On this graphic, in the blue shade is the normal snowpack for the north part of the California mountains, the central part in the, in the middle, and then the south part of the California mountains in the, in the bottom. The top purple line is the 82-83 season, so much above normal. The, what's red is the 1976-77 line, and then that dark purple that kind of ends midway is the current season. So at about 10% in the north, 13% in the central, and 15% in the south. This was in mid-March. The report released just yesterday said that the snowpack in California at the end of March was 6% of normal. This is far below the previous low in 1976-77. So the, this is an incredible, it, it's almost um, uh, makes you speechless when you think about the impact that this could have on the state of California as we go forward. It's interesting to compare also because April 1 tends to be the time of the maximum snowpack uh, development in, uh, in the western United States. This graphic here is the snowpack from NRCS and uh, at the end of March. Uh, and what you see is this is percentile, so it might not be very easy to see, but the percentiles of the snowpack and if you can see any greens on there, that would be a percentile that would be above normal. There are a few greens scattered along the east slopes of the Rockies. The reds are at about a five percentile of, um, uh, compared to normal. And there are actually a lot of dots on there that show that the snow has actually melted out from many of the snow courses. And this goes from the Sierra Nevadas all the way up here into Washington. That's unprecedented for April 1, which again tends to be the time of the maximum accumulation of the snowpack in a winter season in the western United States. So this is not just a California issue, it's a west-wide issue that we'll be facing this year. As a result, NRCS forecasts for stream flow are represented on this graphic. Um, Anything green is about is normal, so any blues that you might see, and there are a few scattered along there in Montana, a few in, in Colorado, would be above normal. Yellows, oranges, reds are below normal, and you can see uh, the stream flow predictions for the summer look fairly dire. So does this look familiar to anyone? And the reason why I ask that is because there was a study put together by Pierce and Can in the Journal of Climate in 2013. And what they did is they ran models, 14 of them, of what the snow water equivalent or the snowpack would look in the western United States going forward. Well, they ran it for 1960 through 2000 and then forward up to 2100. And that dark black line is the ensemble mean or the, the, the average of those models, and you can see that there's a strong decrease as we get toward 2100 in what the snowpack accumulation is going to be in the western mountains. And again, the water management in the west is set around snowpack. So what is this going to do? What challenge is this going to present to water management in the west as we go forward? The other thing that comes to my mind as I look at this and you put yourself in 2015 on this graphic, is yes, those models do show a decrease, but they do not show those extreme events very well, like the extreme event we are currently experiencing here in the 2014-2015 snow season. And so you've got to be able to build in those ex extreme events into your planning and management strategies. This leads nicely into a second lesson Monitoring and early warning information is often the starting point for engaging stakeholders on drought planning and, and risk management. Uh, window, it's a window of opportunity for engagement with stakeholders. We now have a way in to talk to 
uh, folks in western Oklahoma and Texas, for example, or parts of the west because of the drought that they're experiencing. This information is very visual. It, it's conceptually something that stakeholders can relate to. It does allow trust to build between the stakeholders with the data and being able to make decisions. And one thing is you cannot manage what's not being monitored. So we are learning this lesson over and over again that good monitoring of current conditions is very important. So the drought monitor, um, it's, it is a uh, partnership of the USDA, NOAA, and the National Drought Mitigation Center. There is also a network of about 400 experts around the country that regularly put in input into this product as it gets developed every week. It is a convergence of evidence approach to produce this map showing these current conditions. If you think about the progress we have made over the years, it's tremendous. We've made incredible progress in terms of monitoring drought in the last 20 years. And there's a lot of progress and opportunities to be made going forward. Uh, Dr. Henry uh, mentioned remote sensing. There are a lot of remote sensing techniques that are currently in development and currently being developed that, that will help us in drought monitoring going forward. If you look at where we were, this is a, a drought map from 1934 put out by USDA. It looks somewhat similar in terms of the regions depicted and so forth, but if you think about how is this produced, how is this disseminated, and you think about today with social media and the internet, uh, the opportunities are uh, uh, impressive what we have at our, our availability today compared to what we've had in the past. The drought monitor is in GIS, so you can go in and become much more specific with locations. You can do overlays. This is why USDA uses uh, the drought monitor for many of its drought relief decision-making processes in the United States. And it's also a basis for drought forecasting. So this is the seasonal drought outlook that's put together by the Climate Prediction Center out of NOAA uh, once a month, but this is a three-month looking forward product. It takes that US drought monitor map that I showed you just before, and it projects ahead what that map might look like at the end of June uh, 2015. So what they show is drought persisting, in much of the western U.S. or even getting uh, expanding here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, some expansion and persistence in the upper Midwest, and then some improvements in that uh, drought area in the southern plains. So this is, we've got a lot of opportunities ahead of us in terms of drought forecasting as well, and a lot of uh, resources are going into improved drought forecasting at many institutions around the country. Another lesson is that planning ahead and mitigation reduces vulnerability impacts and the need for some government intervention. It's a good investment. One of the things we need to work on is how do we get people to understand or see or quantify that investment that they make in terms of finances or time toward these efforts and what does that save them in terms of, of uh, investments as well. So at the National Drought Mitigation Center, we work on, on planning, planning processes at a variety of scales. We work with local individuals, communities, tribes, uh, at basin level and at the national level. In fact, we have a, a workshop that's taking place in Lincoln today and tomorrow with the four tribes in the state of Kansas. And we're working on drought planning, uh, the drought planning process with those tribes in Kansas. One topic, I'll just touch on one of those kind of scales that we work with that I think is most applicable for this audience this morning, is we do work with livestock producers and we've developed a, a program called Managing Drought Risk on the Ranch. So the website for that project is on the left and the guide that was produced in 2012 for that project 
is on the right. One of the things that was really unique about this project, or I think was unique about this project, was that it was really the livestock producers that developed uh, this program. They approached the National Drought Mitigation Center and identified that they are working from drought plans for their operations, and these are the, the original livestock producers that were part of this project. So they're the ones that actually developed the materials for this managing drought risk on the ranch uh, project. Um, from that, uh, we, are, uh, we have been doing workshops in the Northern Plains, but we now, uh, this year in 2015, will be doing workshops in the Southern Plains with livestock producers in Oklahoma and Texas, with, working with the Climate Change Hub of USDA and the Climate Science Center of the Department of Interior to help host uh, workshops for livestock producers in the Southern Plains. One case study that has come out of that that I think illustrates that cycle of disaster management that I showed you earlier is from Ted Alexander's uh, ranch in South Central Kansas. He has a, a plan that has several components, one that focuses on monitoring conditions, because monitoring is a very important uh, part of that cycle. He has identified critical decision dates in which he needs to have that information and, and make decisions from that information. He looks at short-term responses due to the development or the evolution of, of conditions. And then he has a set of long-term mitigation strategies based on five grazing principles that, that he uses. So you can really see how that cycle of disaster management is illustrated within uh, this case study from Ted Alexander. So all of this, and I think what Dr. Henry mentioned earlier uh, several times, is that none of this can be done because of the complexity of the issue of drought, the issue of climate, water, and so forth. None of this is possible without partnerships and networks um, to reach the stakeholders. So there are many opportunities for these networks and partnerships at the federal level. I've listed just a couple of those there, but there's also state, local, and NGO resources. I feel that universities are extremely critical for building this capacity through, through research, and, and uh, the project Rick and everyone is involved with here is a good example of that. Extension is key. We do have some climate extension specialists that really help with this area as they are being uh, placed in, in universities around the country. And then I would say a key partner in all of this has to be the media, because they are one way to get out and, and communicate uh, with the public. One project that I will mention as I wrap up here is a project that really illustrates this concept of partnerships. It's the useful to usable project, U to U. Linda Procopi at Purdue is the, the lead uh, PI on this. And these are uh, the institutions that are involved. There are 10 land-grant institutions across the Midwest. And then folks from a variety of disciplines, because you need that discipline, interdisciplinary nature to address some of the complexities. So in this uh, project, some surveys were done, a couple of them. In the green basins, uh, corn producers were surveyed. and. Um, about 28,000 corn producers in that region were, were surveyed. In the states, the three states surrounded by orange, advisors to those corn producers were surveyed. There were about 8,000 advisors that were surveyed. So you had corn producers and crop advisors um, surveyed. And those surveys were compared. And so in just one question that I'll show here this morning, uh, who or how influential are the following groups and individuals when you make decisions about agricultural practices and strategies? So this graphic here shows the, the various groups on the bottom axis, and then the uh, amount of influence on the, uh, on the bars. Yellows and browns at the top have more influence than the purples and the blues at the bottom. So a couple of things to highlight. First, on the far left, 
family, chemical dealers, and seed dealers tend to be the most influential with the individual crop producers. So remember, that's key, that this is for the crop producers. The chemical dealers and seed dealers, we would call the advisors. So the advisors are very influential to the individual producers. Extension is kind of mixed, so the influence of extension, but don't get disappointed yet. Uh, because when you go to this next question, how much do you trust or distrust the following agencies, organizations, or groups for the information about climate change and its potential impacts? Extension was the number one uh, trusted source. Remember, these are the, this question, sorry, I didn't mention this, this question was to the advisors. So extension is very trusted by the advisors. The advisors are influential to the producers. So it's very important for us to know that we need to be working with extension because extension has the influence on the advisors and then the advisors have the influence on the individual producers. That chain of information flow is very critical for us to, to understand. So this is one example of how a network or a partnership can, needs to be produced to develop some information along these lines. So some of the key messages related to uh, what I've been discussing this morning is this point that temperatures matter. So temperatures are increasing. There's this issue as we go forward of how is this going to affect drought and are there going to be more of these hot droughts that are going to influence how we manage um, various situations, our resources. This issue of decreased snowpacks is going to be critical in the West, but it's also critical for a place like Nebraska, which gets a lot of our water uh, from Western snow as well. What the, all of this is going to do is put continued or increased stress on water resources, and that's, uh, nothing, that's not a surprise, certainly. And so therefore, proactive risk management, as I showed in that risk management cycle, is definitely a change because we need to adopt this, these uh, practices and a challenge, but it really leads to uh, many opportunities. And that may sound a little bit like a cliche, but I definitely believe that and, and uh, look forward to working uh, at a variety of levels uh, to try to adopt this proactive risk management approach, not only to droughts, but extreme climate events as well. So, uh, thank you. Okay, we do have time for questions. And questions for Dr. Hayes? In the back. Mike, Justin Derner here from the USDA Climate Hub. Do you have projections into the future by regions on drought vulnerabilities for agriculture available? That's, thanks, Justin. That's a great question. So um, I would say there's a step that needs to be taken. We need to understand uh, the hazard, future drought frequency, and then how that adjusts to vulnerability. Vulnerability tends to be the uh, how the management and the hazard tend to, to work together. And so they're almost kind of two separate issues that then you try to have to merge together to really understand and get to the answer to your question. If you look at future drought events and how they might occur, um, certainly a lot of work is still going into understanding the frequency, the severity, the characteristic of what drought events are going to look like in the future. And um, I, I think understanding the impacts of what temperature is going to do on those droughts is, is kind of where we need to take that, that research. If you look at drought and water supplies, the areas of agreement tend to be that the West is going to become drier and hotter, and places like the Mideast is going to uh, be kind of a centralized location for more droughts, more water scarcity issues, parts of Australia, perhaps. 
Um, I think the eastern United States, it's a little bit un unknown yet what's going to happen with drought events. So that addresses kind of the event aspect of your question. Vulnerability, um, I think if we can work on addressing how we are vulnerable to current drought events, we can hopefully reduce some of our vulnerability to the future drought events, regardless of what our, our climate might be doing as we go forward and what some of the models might be showing. So I think, uh, you know, certainly some of the work that NRCS is doing towards improving sustainability through uh, soil resources and some of your work with, with uh, grazing principles, these are key uh, issues that we need to be pushing for and, and moving, stressing as we move forward to hopefully reduce our vulnerability to not only current drought events, but future drought events as well. So I hope I answered your question. All right, thanks. Any other questions for Dr. Hayes? Okay, if not, well, thank you very much. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Okay, just a quick announcement before we break. Uh, for those of you who are showing posters uh, in ballroom three, the poster boards are, are up. You can uh, free to put the posters wherever you would like. There's no designated uh, poster boards. And so if you have your posters with you over the break and want to go ahead and get those up before the tours this afternoon, uh, that would be fine. So we have... Uh, a 15-minute break will start uh, promptly at 10.15. That way we conclude and, and get uh, off of, uh, at our tours on uh, promptly. Thank you. 10.15, uh, please. <laughs>